Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'll be, I guess, chairing this panel. Um, this is our ethics panel. I'm not going to take too much time because we're a little behind because of the brilliance of the uh, previous panel. Um, so what we wanted to do is, uh, you know, we wanted to have some space to talk about, um, you know, what role ethics plays in, in how we're building these collections um, of social media <laughs> archives, web archives. Um, how do we think about people um, as, as we're working with these um, collections of data? Um, and so we have some experts up here who are going to talk from uh, their experiences about the work that they've been doing and how they think about ethics and how uh, they think we should be sort of approaching this work. Um, and I'll let people um, introduce themselves. I should introduce myself again. Uh, Burgess Jules, I'm an archivist at University of California, Riverside. My name is Stacy Williams, and I am an archivist currently living in Cleveland. This is Allison, hopefully he'll be very mellow while we're chatting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, my interest sort of around this in terms of ethics, uh, I, my research interests in general sort of center around like cyber racism and information architecture, um, and also the ethics of labor in, in archives work. I also used to be a journalist for about, well, I say used to, I still do <laughs> editorial work. Um, so I also keep that perspective in mind. I guess I don't need the mic. I guess I don't need the mic. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Yvonne Ng. I'm an archivist. I work at Witness, which is an international nonprofit organization that supports activists who are using video to document human rights abuses. So, um, you know, in our work, we're always very concerned about ethics because we work directly with the people who are creating the documentation and with people who are, whose, whose lives are being captured in the documentation. What's going on? Uh, my name is Dexter Thomas. Um, I am a graduate student at Cornell, still working on a PhD. Um, until recently, I was at the LA Times, and I am just recently started at uh, Vice on HBO. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into more. So just keep the introductions moving. Um, I'm Alexandra Dolan Meskel. I'm a user experience designer for UCR Library right now. Um, but I was, I kind of got that job because I was working through building ethical digital spaces around Occupy and some queer feminist zine collections in New York. And I'm now trying to figure out how to put my expertise in user experience design into doing design for social good and embedding ethics into design. So, um, yeah, I think we can just launch into it. Did you have any order in which you wanted to go in? Do we have slides or? You got the slides, you want to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. I can go first. Um, so I'm just going to run the slides on my computer, too, because I can't see what I'm showing you. So um, so yeah, so be, um, as I mentioned, I, I work at Witness, and we deal um, with videos. So I'm pr primarily going to be talking about the ethical considerations of using and collecting um, video that's shared in, in social media. Um, and just before I start, I, I wanted to acknowledge um, my colleague, um, Madeline Baer, from the Witness Media Lab, um, whose um, work a lot of this presentation is, is based on. So um, with this presentation, I'm, I'm going to, there's a little bit of audience participation involved. Um, I'm going to have a little, like, very quick uh, po poll, pop, pop, poll. Um, and so just, it, it's, it's, it's heavily oversimplified, but this is just for the purposes of, of uh, getting us talking about these ethical issues. So um, here are a couple of uh, real life examples that we've um, dealt with at Witness. Okay, so imagine you work at an international human rights organization and you're researching from afar um, military raids in indigenous villages in Guatemala. And on a blog of a local uh, community media group, you find a video of a woman who witnessed the raid and who gives a very clear and compelling testimony. So um, in your report about the raid, do you A, um, embed or include the video, B, describe the contents of the testimony without sharing the video, C, 
edit the video to blur her face and then use the redacted version, or D, um, provide a link to the local group's blog where the video was originally posted. So just a quick, you know, we're, this, we don't have a lot of time, but who, who would do A? B? A couple of Bs? Uh, C? Yeah, maybe C, and D? Okay, so a lot of Ds. Um, and who doesn't have enough information to, to really make a, a decision? Okay, a lot of people, yeah. <laughs> so what, what are some of the questions that you would have that would help you make that decision? Does anybody want to toss out something? I guess the place of the woman within that community and her safety in sharing the information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the intent of the video, yeah. What's the report for and where, where exactly? Right. Yeah, and how does that align with what her, you know, what her reasons for making the video were? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, forgetting this with this. Um, you know, you've brought up um, many of the questions that I was um, going to share here. Um, so, you know, we want to know was informed consent and permission given by both the, you know, the woman in the video and the person who created and uploaded the video. And in the absence of that, um, you know, was, is there an apparent intent or context surrounding the creation of the video that can inf help us inform our decisions? Um, you know, Alexandra mentioned what would be the impact on the safety, the dignity, and the privacy of the people who are shown and on the, also on the safety of the video maker or the uploader. Um, and at the same time, um, what would be the potential impact of sharing this video on, uh, wider, uh, on the wider community or to action on this issue? Um, so, you know, is this video, could it really make a unique difference to, um, you know, to advocacy on this issue or to, um, people's understanding of, of what's going on there. Um, on the other hand, you know, does this video maybe not show us any um, new information that, that we need to know, and is it really necessary to share this video if it puts um, people, potentially puts people at risk? Um, and if we do want to share this video, are there ways that we can share the video and still protect the subjects and the creators? And finally, um, what would be the impact of this video on the viewer or the audience? So, you know, is the, is the information in the video truthful or is it misleading? And what is our responsibility to the people who are, uh, who we're sharing this video um, with? Um, are we being transparent about our objectives in collecting and using this video? Um, and then also, you know, if not in this case, but if the, if the video is, let's say, very graphic or has sort of gratuitous content, um, you know, do we have an obligation to warn our viewers of what they're um, going to see? Um, and, you know, even, even if we have the answers to some of these questions, um, I think there's still a lot of uh, ethical tensions that remain that we might not necessarily be able to answer. Um, you know, a lot of times there is indeterminacy about the consent and permission. So you don't know who the source of the video is and you, or you can't contact the source. Um, so you have to sort of rely on professional judgment, um, weighing the value of the information, the potential risk. Um, and, and as you were saying before, uh, the, the apparent sort of intent behind the video. So was the video made in order to advocate on this issue? Like, it, was it clear that you know, they, they made this video so that it could get out? Um, another um, tension is, you know, weighing individual interests. So we talked about the privacy, dignity, safety of the, of the individuals in the video with the, you know, potential impact that this video could have. So the community or public interest. And then finally, um, you know, in, in, in efforts to, let's say, to, to protect um, privacy, dignity of the individuals, you know, we can rely on anonymization um, techniques. But, you know, how do we weigh anonymization and the value of that against the ability of people 
to, let's say, use and verify that video. So if this video um, was to be used, let's say, in, in, a, in, a, in a legal situation, um, what are we losing by um, anonymizing the, the person giving the testimony and the source? Okay, so I just have one more scenario. So, um, and this is a different situation. This is a, a, a video shot by the perpetrator. Um, so you're a journalist, um, and an LGBTQ activist alerts you to an online video from Russia that shows a group of young men harassing and taunting a young gay man, saying that the video will be posted on Russian social media, on a Russian social media site, and he will be outed to his family via the video. So, in your reporting, do you, A, you don't include the video because it would further harm the victim? Um, B, do you edit the video to blur the victim's face um, and then include that re-upload? Do you C, edit the footage and blur all of the faces, including those of the perpetrators, and include that in your, uh, include that in your report? Or D, do you embed the unredacted video in your report because it's already out there anyways. Um, straw pool A, A, okay. Um, B, C, oh interesting, okay. Um, D, no Ds, I didn't think I'd have there be any Ds. Um, does anybody feel strongly about why they have their, 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 about their choice or what, what thoughts come to, to mind? Or what are some of the conundrums? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I would say, editorially speaking, I'd be curious as to why, you know, you'd want to ask why are we including this yeah. video? I mean, yeah. outside of the need for the clicks. What, what is it about including this video that's going to you know, lend more context to the issue mm -hmm. of, you know, perhaps, I, I'm assuming it would be a story about, like, homophobia uh, in Russia or, you know, maybe harassment of, of, of LGBTQ um, folks in that particular part of the world. I mean, is there not, you could, you could more or less ask, is there not a way that we could still tell that story without actually outing someone, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I know just recently happened, and I'm blanking on the the news organization, what was it? Yeah, during the Olympics. I can't remember the news org that did it. The Daily Beast. The Daily Beast, yes, Daily Beast, um, where they had the guy going in and, and doing the, um, you know, he was looking on Grindr and essentially outed some of these Olympians who may have to return to their countries uh, in places that, you know, may, they may face uh, very serious homophobia um, or harassment or, you know, physical uh, physical violence for that, and it was it was pretty awful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, absolutely, what you were saying. So, is the video is the video itself a form of abuse? And you know, if 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 we feel it is important to use the video, um, are there ways to do it that does not further traumatize or dehumanize the victim? Um, but I think the key question is, does it, like, do we need, even need to reshare the video at all? Like, are there ways that the information, um, the story can be told without having to, to show the video? Um, I mean, what is the impact on the viewer or the audience? And does sharing the video just like stoke fear or incite hatred or otherwise it's further the aims of the perpetrator? Um, and then the, the the final question I wanted to raise, and you know, I noticed that nobody nobody put up their hand for C. Is like, should we do we need to be concerned about the rights of the perpetrator? Um, and I think you know our sort of you know our immediate reaction is like you know screw the screw them like who cares like they're the ones hurting um, this person. But you know like do we know the context under which the perpetrators were working under? Were they working under certain constraints? Um, you know if they are they working in con are, are they were they operating in context where they if it was a crime they're not going to receive a fair trial um, will they themselves be subject to inhumane treatment um, if they are identified 
So, um, yeah. So I just want to play devil's advocate here. This is a really okay. interesting example. But how do we square this? Like everyone was uh, uncomfortable, like, oh, I'm not sure we should include that video. How do we square this with what we just heard in Pat's panel, where the people told us, tell the whole story, the ugly, the whole thing. These things seem okay. And everyone was on board with that. Like, so I'm not sure I can resolve these conflicts. Mm -hmm. well, we've got Well, I think that they were also framing that discussion around we were talking about the archive and the long term. And obviously, as some of them are dealing with legal judgments now, um, they're already in the thick of it. The things that they've done are not suddenly going to be used to document against them. That's already happened, and it hasn't happened through the archive. But one of the questions that I would have liked to ask that group that we didn't get to is, are they concerned with legal ramifications in the long term? Um, I mean, I think we're looking for ways to tell the full story with, without putting people in danger or without compromising their, their privacy and dignity. And it's a matter of how, how do we do that? Maybe it's anonymization, but of course, you know, there's the, the trade-off I mentioned before. But it's like if you anonymize, then it makes it more difficult for people using it in different contexts later on. So, go ahead. I think um, ethics are a problem when you have two rights or two values that come into conflict and like how do you yeah. juggle this? So on the one hand, here you have the, I think you said the safety, privacy, and dignity of people. And I think what's on the flip side of that that's implied that we haven't talked about is evidence and citation. So if you're just linking or you're just embedding, how do you actually document? You know, how do you have proof if you need proof later? Mm -hmm. Or how do you, you know, and that's a question for journalists, that's a question for scholars. But that is what's on the, kind of the flip side of how do we save and actually have proof or evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just as I, oops, just to wrap up, um, so, so the, these examples and other examples, um, we have been written up in uh, something that Witness has published, uh, ethical guidelines on using eyewitness video. Um, in, for human rights recording advocacy. It doesn't, you know, of course, doesn't provide any answers, but it sort of just captures some of um, the thinking in my organization uh, on some of these very tricky issues. Um, so uh, the, the report's broken up into uh, three different sections. Uh, first, looking at, you know, our responsibilities to the individuals and communities that are represented. So as I mentioned, in terms of their consent, their safety, dignity, and privacy. Um, in terms of our responsibility to the video creators and the video uploaders, so again, their safety, their intent behind making the videos, um, you know, giving them attribution and credit and seeking permission. And finally, our responsibility to the audiences or the viewers. So in terms of truthfulness, being transparent about our objectives, about providing um, adequate context for what we're sharing, and also um, potentially warnings um, of it for graphic content. That's it for me. <laughs> go ahead. Um, <laughs> go, I was, go ahead. Go right ahead. Uh, you're up. 
Am I up? You're up. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think for, <laughs> so I think, um, I think for me, I mean, we delved more deeply into this issue of ethics uh, last summer. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Jared Drake, who's sitting right there, um, on, a, on an oral history collection that was titled A People's History of Violence, A People's History of Police Violence in Cleveland. Um, and when the project first started, I mean, it's, it's sort of like had been discussed on, on the last two panels. We had, we were discussing this idea of working with individuals and activists in Cleveland who, um, who were vulnerable, gave any consequence, any potentially unforeseen consequences for them, like, um, threat of, you know, under threat of retribution from police for discussing, um, you know, discussing past instances or ongoing legal, uh, legal action that, that they were undertaking against the Cleveland Police Department. So, um, you know, I think on our end, we were really trying to, the, the big idea was to do no harm. And underpinning the project was also this idea that the activists were running the show. We were you know, we were there and continue to call ourselves sort of an advisory board. We're here to answer questions and help guide, but we felt that it was very important for the activists um, and the regular people who were, um, who were taking the risk, quite frankly, of sharing their stories with us in that way, um, that they should have autonomy over the project and over uh, how they wanted to tell these stories. So, um, you know, so I think I think our general idea was do no harm to the people who were going to be brave enough to share these stories with us. Um, so to that end, I I had a few examples of things that I thought were um, you know that were following this idea of do no harm, this idea of best practices in terms of uh, ethical. Um, you know, just good ethical best practices around collection uh, development in the field, around um, sustainability. Uh, so the first, the first thing that I, you know, was really drawn to, and this was, uh, this happened a couple of years before we did the Cleveland project, but um, it's a project that I think still, you know, did a really good job with this, is um, the Thick Mapping Hypercities uh, Digital Humanities Project at UCLA. Um, overseen, I, I want to say, by Todd Pressner. Um, so they were gathering all of this data from the Arab Spring on social media. And it was Twitter, but it was also embedded third party media. So you know, activists were using Twitter to embed YouTube links. Um, and so what they did was strip, as they were gathering this data, they stripped where they could geotags, timestamps, um, and even user names, or in some cases like the, the avatar, because some of these people were dissidents and they were, um, you know, they could have been killed for sharing that information basically, jailed or killed. So uh, as I started digging into that project, I just, I felt like it was a really great example of the manner in which they tried to protect the people who were brave enough to share this information. Um, you know, and in such a way that it could be accessible to someone like me on the other side of the world and I could learn a little bit more about what happened, uh, but also, yes, protecting them. Um, there was, from the, from the journalism side, um, this was back in 2014. Um, a Twitter user started a hashtag called what I was wearing in response to, um, in response to the idea behind rape culture that you know a woman's attire is the basis for an assault, um, and I I had actually followed it all that night. I mean it was very compelling um, because what you saw in large part was a lot of women jumping on the thread, uh, saying you know I was wearing like a you know like a My Little Pony shirt or some pajamas, because I was, you know, six, or I was seven. Um, so really, you know, trying to dismantle this idea that, you know, what you wear has anything to do with, uh, anything to do with an assault. So it was this really powerful thread, I followed it all night, and then in the morning, um, I saw that BuzzFeed had, you know, aggregated, because this is, this is the media world we live in, it's about, you know, aggregation of, 
of others content in a lot of ways. So BuzzFeed had aggregated it and they did not get permission or they were not able to obtain permission of the woman who started the hashtag before they printed. Um, the author said later that she did get permission from, because they embedded whole tweets in the story. So she said that she had received permission from some of the women in the story to uh, show their, their names and avatars. But um, the woman who started the hashtag uh, said that she had purposely gone through before she started retweeting the responses to ask the other, to ask the women and the men who were sharing their stories to say, hey, is it okay if I retweet you? Just this very simple act of you know, recognizing someone else's right to maybe want to be left alone. Because I think the thing about Twitter is yes, archivists and a lot of other people are always quick to make the argument like, hey, it's a public space. Um, you know, you, you don't even own your, con you don't own what you put on Twitter, but I think it's worth recognizing that for a lot of people, you know, especially the type of people who don't have followers that number in the, the multiple thousands here, that for a lot of people, Twitter really is just like a conversation that they're having at a cafe. Um, if you were out at a coffee shop tomorrow, I can hear your conversation at the next table. Does that mean I have the right to, to video, to record your conversation? No, I do not. Um, and even though, you know, this might be happening in what appears to be a public space, you still have a lot of people who, who consider Twitter this, this kind of intimate exchange of ideas. Um, so I think it was, I think it was worth pointing out that project because she, uh, you know, she had gone through, she took the time to respond to people and just simply ask. And I think it's, you know, when you're talking about who is creating this information that we seek to collect or report about, um, how hard is it to just ask? <laughs> like, why have we gotten to this point where we feel like mm -hmm. just simply asking people, hey, is this okay, is a bad thing. Um, and then the, the third example, uh, which I guess I was, part of, um, back when the Occupy movements were, were very strong and going on, I was working with uh, a very awesome crew of archivists uh, in Boston on the, at the Occupy Boston site. So we had a library, um, it was the, the Audre Lorde to Howard Zinn library, but we were also collecting materials. Uh, so when the camps got shut down, uh, there were a lot of other sites in which um, people had started, and, and it was academics by and large, academics had started looting the Occupy sites for materials because they were so convinced like, oh, well, this is really important, but it became clear over time that it was less about the fact that they felt like the materials were important and more about just kind of elevating their, their own personal academic careers uh, and notoriety. So. Um, in Boston, like the collection, you know, as we, we, we kind of knew beforehand uh, that they were gonna, that the police were gonna raid the camp. So we had already made the decision to start taking the materials out of there. And the collection was decentralized in that way because it was pretty much just like, hey, you got a car, uh, come through, come grab these signs, come grab these posters. Like, um, and we had, we had gone through and even created a finding aid uh, that was just, you know, itemized with, all of the things that we had at that point in time. Uh, so time went on and we just sat on it. I mean, there was this huge rush by a lot of people to you know, donate and, and get your name out there as having been the one to put the collection in. But we sat on it for a really long time. Um, and those of us who had worked on you know, really gathering and organizing the materials, shout out to Boston Radical Reference, um, we, we felt very strongly that it wasn't just about um, the sort of practical, technical concerns of stewardship, like, oh, you know, do they, uh, what is their, um, you know, what's their, like, info, what's their major infrastructure like for processing and things like that. I mean, those things were important to us, but we also felt like it was really important to hold on to the collection and wait until we found a repository um, that was really going to respect what was there. Uh, preferably a repository that had collections um, about it, that were focused on social movements. Um, and also not just the repository, but we also wanted to make sure that the archivists who were over those collections, um, that they understood 
the value of what they had and that they also understood how to make that material accessible in a way that generated context toward a broader range of social movements, um, whether, you know, whether online or, or more analog, you could say. So, um, so it was just a really, you know, the, the archivists who were still in the Boston area, because some of us had, you know, moved at that point. I had moved twice <laughs> at that point, um, and other people had had moved around. But the archivists who were still there in the Boston area, I mean, they they physically like went to repositories or they spoke and had conversations with the archivists who were uh, running those collections. Um, to really make that decision because we wanted it to be right, we wanted the politics behind the stewardship to be right, and we wanted to feel like the, um, you know, the donation of that collection was going to go somewhere where it could do the best and highest possible good, um, which was all we had been trying to accomplish on the ground when we were at the camp. Um, so I, I think. As we move forward and we think about, you know, legal or ethical implications of, of archiving social media, um, you know, I think it's it's really worth asking, um, you know, looking number one at at projects that could be models for best practices, but also worth asking. I mean, um, how how can we do the best possible good with this collection? How do we um, how do we hold on to it in such a way or make it accessible in such a way that it it is of the um, highest benefit toward the greater good. I mean, so let's take a half an hour for the rest of because I want you know we have lunch and I want the other panel to um, to have an opportunity to eat before they have to sit up okay. here. So, so we got another half hour. Yeah, That's we have half an hour. Okay, gotcha. Half an hour. All right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, so I also um, kind of got my feet wet with uh, doing work with Occupy. And um, being a web developer and user experience designer, I was really interested in um, the time and location-based uh, nature of Occupy documentation and how it was happening every moment and how to show a representative um, archive of that and not just like in the Omeka style, here are objects and they are date stamped, um, but have a way of um, building a tool that would really capture things that were happening as they were happening. So um, I built off of the Ushahidi platform, which was a platform that was developed in Kenya in 2008 after the rigged elections there. Um, and it was to document violence that was happening around the country. So it kind of had this time and location-based thing built into it. Um, and we built out a phone app so that people who were at the Occupy sites, I was living in New York at the time, um, could join if they wanted, but we didn't take any physical media. We ended up getting some, but we weren't really interested in that, and we weren't interested in even having necessarily an archival record of what people were loading. And sometimes they were just loading, like, I'm at this geolocation, and here's a picture of it, and there's nobody in it, but it's just like, this is happening, this was the title of it. Um, and sometimes they were these full oral history accounts with lots of pictures and sound bites, even just of the sounds happening on the street, which were really cool. Um, but the idea that we were trying to enact there was that um, everybody had their own account. You, anyone could get an account, anyone could put stuff up, anyone could take stuff down. So um, I was working at the Queens College Civil Rights Archives at the time, and you know, head archivist does not like that idea of not being able to keep everything and not having um, the proper provenance necessarily. You could load things anonymously. Um, and what became really apparent to me, which Stacy kind of spoke to a little, is uh, there was a violence of archival intervention happening with Occupy that was changing the narrative and creating some superstar archivists and researchers and um, really corrupting a movement that was already falling apart from the inside out anyway, but um, we were not helping, or archivists were not helping. Um, even activist archivists really probably weren't helping. Um, and one of the questions that I have been struggling with is like, I'm not sure that archives should even be doing it right now, capturing everything right now. And I know it's that imperative to like get it before it's gone. It's Twitter. It's happening. You know, hundred thousands every seconds. If it's not, it might not be there the next second. So we have to capture. Um, but I also think that um, you know, having the agency to donate something to an archive when you've kind of 
collected it and thought about it and been a person and like you have that power there is important and we lose that when we just start actively capturing on um, social media. Even if we are then asking for consent, uh, getting consent is a lot different than like shaping the narrative um, or being able to annotate the narrative that is built out of the archive. Um, and archivists, I think, have their heart in the right place, but not always like all the contextual information that is needed to make the kinds of decisions of what should be in the archive. So um, with all of those concerns, uh, here I am helping build Doc Now with a great team of people. Uh, and as Yvonne said on our user interview, um, it's a surveillance tool in, you know, if you just like throw it out there, that's what it does. So how do we build this in a way that embeds the conversations that are happening here in the interests of the people who are doing such good work here um, so that anyone, because the tool is going to be open, anyone is going to be able to use it, not everyone is going to have the same like, you know, questions and concerns that all of us in this room have. So, um, you know, another thing that we all know about technology is the people who build technology have their own embedded cultural and personal biases within the technology. So trying to be very aware even as like I as me am putting my effort into it and Dan and Ed and Francis, we all have our own things. So trying to keep our own um, biases at check and build in as many kind of pieces to the tool that give you that moment to say, hey, is there an ethical consideration here? Trying to be transparent about, you know, we built it this way, so you might not be able to do this, and there's a purpose for that. We don't, you know, or yeah, you can grab a, um, a whole person's account, but we're not gonna let you until you've actually gotten permission, and they have, like, they have a login or something, or, you know, just examples of ways that we could build things that really at least make people question what they're doing when they're using the tool, even though I'm sure most of the people in this room already are thinking strongly about that. Um, so, yeah, technology is not agnostic. Um, people, who are using, you know, these tweets are not just data, they are people, and they deserve a form of agency and empowerment in helping build the archives with us. And then um, Ruben had mentioned in the last panel that, uh, you know, that this tool is not the beginning or the end of a project. And I want the tool to very clearly say that so that someone doesn't go like, I'm gonna start a social media archiving project and I'm downloading this thing and now I have a whole set. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done on both ends of using the tool to make sure that the project is ethical. Um, so I guess one last comment about publicness. That's been a really big uh, part of the user interviews that I've done so far with all of you. Um, what is public? Okay, verified accounts on Twitter, you can, you know, those are public. We can take those and do what we will with them. Uh, is there a way that technologically we can help get to a point of like creating an algorithm for determining publicness based on retweets and number of followers and substantive um, activism within that hashtag in the past and you know after that point? Are there ways that we can say like, hey, you know what, this really you shouldn't retweet it because this doesn't meet a threshold technologically of what public means? So. Um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you because I hope that you can help guide us in thinking about the ways we can really embed um, design for social good into Doc Now. Cool. Um, yeah, thank you. Wow, okay, there's, and I just have to say that um, I'm really happy that we have somebody working on the user interface because there is so much, um, academic and or research software out there that is the interface and the usability is just absolute trash. And I'm not just some, you know, hey, I, I love Apple and Apple is beautiful and I love that they make good products and I'm really happy that people are making stuff with nice fonts or whatever. Um, this, is, this is actually a serious thing because if, if it's not usable, then it's just that, it's not usable. And, um, and it's not accessible and so people who don't have 20 hours to throw at learning some really difficult software um, who, who you know, are, don't have that kind of time um, are not going to have any access to this. So I think um, that's you know, something that I'm, I'm actually very happy um, that that's been considered in this project. So I guess um, I'll talk a little bit from the perspective, I guess, of, of a journalist. but. 
And I, I want to echo um, a lot of things that were said about, um, about privacy, I guess, about using people's tweets. Um, and so personally, so my policy, and I'm, I've not always followed this, um, but pretty quickly on when I started, I decided that I needed to ask people um, if I was going to use their tweet. Specifically, if it was something that was at all s sensitive, I guess. Um, and so this goes for people talking about speaking out against racism, speaking out against transphobia, speaking out against homophobia. You know, and exactly as you were saying, there's some, uh, you know, the, the aggregated kind of content where we say, hey, here's the new hot hashtag that people are talking about that talks about women's rights. And then it's a two sentence opener, flashy headline, and then basically just 10 tweets with people saying that exact same thing. And it's, you know, they're interesting, it's great examples. And in a way it's necessary because part of the reason why we're here is because Twitter is kind of by design ephemeral. Uh, things, if you're not there at that time, you miss out. And so for people who don't sit on Twitter all day, those sorts of aggregated articles are helpful. Uh, the thing about that, though, is that by including somebody in one of those aggregated tweet stories, you're potentially opening them up to trolls. And that is something that people do not consider. And so I said that that was my policy. That was my personal policy. So, and I'm not going to beat up on any organizations. I'm not going to name any names. Um, I can say that where I was, the LA Times, there was no policy about that. Nothing official anyway. Nothing, nothing I was aware of. And so if you were going to quote a tweet, quote a tweet. If you're going to embed a tweet, embed a tweet. And, but I've talked to people at a whole lot of other organizations and I've yet to speak to somebody who said, yeah, actually, we have a very specific protocol against about doing this. Um, there, now, there's all publications have some sort of guidelines about how they write about things. Uh, you know, a lot of people use AP, say, for example. There's a certain way they spell things, a certain way they refer to things. Um, with regards to quoting tweets, with regards to Embedding a tweet, embedding an Instagram post, embedding a Facebook post, there is no protocol for that. My protocol, once again, simply was to send the person a tweet, say, hey, I'm writing a story about this hashtag. Is it OK if I include it? I would say about 99% of the time, people said yes. I can think of one example where somebody said no, and then later on they said, actually, yeah, it's cool, never mind. Um, but. And, and I can think of another example where somebody said, no, I'd, I'd rather not. And again, the, the thing is, and so one, one example where, where I did this was there was a hashtag called um, after September 11th. So I don't know if, if people remember this hashtag. But basically, it was a bunch of really young, young people, people who were, when September 11th, you know, these are people who were Muslim or brown and, you know, basically just brown people, essentially, uh, who, were in, who were babies when September 11th happened. And they were describing, here are the things that happened to my family, here are the things that happened to me when I was a child and I had no idea what was going on. And I knew that anybody doing this would be, sub anybody tweeting about this could be subjected to a whole lot of really bad things. And so again, I asked everybody. And there were some people who I asked, and they said, yeah. And I looked at their tweet, and I said, you know what? I'm just not going to include this. They gave me permission, and I looked at it again, and I said, actually, this might be a little bit too much. Um, I agree with what they're saying, and that was a call that I made. I don't know if it's right or wrong. That was personally mine. But that just I say that to say that there is no definite. Um, it, it's, it's really kind of hard to say, OK, what are we going to do with this? Um, and, and I mean, I've, I've, I have, actually, I have a friend who was tweeting about masculinity, something, and fairly in a benign way. And she got doxxed. And I'm talking about you know, Reddit pages about this person. 
uh, you know, name, phone number, address being posted online. These are things that happen. And, you know, we, we ask permission, for example, if whenever there's a school shooting or there's somebody, uh, there's a fire or something like that and somebody takes video of it, if you look in the person's mentions, you'll see people from all sorts of different news networks saying, hey, can we use your video? Hey, can we put this video on the air? And, okay, if we're asking people for permission to use their content, why can't we just do that across the board? It's not just a rights thing. It's not just a, I'm gonna get sued if I use this video and the person didn't ask me because it's their intellectual property. Okay, the rest of the stuff's intellectual property too. Why are we not doing this? Um, and, yeah, I don't know, actually, I, there's, there's more to say, but I'd kind of like to stop it there because I'd like to leave room for discussion also. Um, yeah, I just have, so one comment, and hopefully we can kick this off. So, you know, we've tackled a lot of these issues when we, uh, in, in, in archives already, right? Um, when we deal with physical collections, right, we have developed these, these processes, right? We call people donors. Right, which sort of uh, uh, transfers sort of privilege to those people. Right, we acknowledge that these are human beings giving us something. Right, and so we acknowledge all the rights and all the privileges that come with that. Um, when we work right now, we do this. Right, as we deal with people giving us physical collections, um, we have a deed of gift that we. It's a contract between the university and that person, or the museum and that person. Um, um, where, you know, that person, you know, we, again, we acknowledge their rights as human beings uh, to give us something that they previously owned, right, to transfer something to us. Um, so these are things we've developed, you know, as we've worked with uh, physical collections over, the, you know, however many years we've been, we've been doing archives. And so there is a model for this already. We're already doing it. Um, but when it comes to sort of web archives and social media archives, we, we throw all that out of the window. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of archivists out there are pushing this, this, this idea that it's public, we can take it, right? And, and that's wrong um, because, you know, we don't do that with any other collections that we deal with, right? We, we acknowledge the humanness of people with any other collection we deal with. We, we, we sign a deed of gift with them, right? We, that, and, and in that deed of gift, um, they could say whatever they want. They could put a restriction on part of the collection saying, you know, you, you can't access this or the public can't access this for 10 years or 20 years or whatever. Um, they can give us part of their collection and not all of it, right? They could say that my children uh, will have a say in how this collection uh, will be made available to the public. These are all things that already happen. We already have these negotiations uh, with folks um, uh, in the archives. But when it comes to social media, web archiving, so this digital space, Space, we, you know, it's like we can't shift our brain to think uh, uh, about, you know, how do we transfer these things that we've developed uh, into that space. And I think a lot of it probably has to do with sort of the vastness of data, right, that we're dealing with when we talk about um, uh, social media. But, you know, we can, we can transfer some of that over. We could at least, at the very least, communicate our values, right, uh, uh, to people. So. Um, one of the things you know, we're thinking about with Doc now is let's just say we can't address any ethical uh, situation sort of uh, through the technology. One thing we can do is we can come up with this concept of uh, a, a, a social media data label, for example, right? Where we can create these unique labels and attach them to data sets of social media collections, right? And a label could say, you know, we would like you to not um, share this collection of, of data with anyone else, or we, you can only access this collection at our institution in the library on an IP protected computer, right? Or um, this collection has um, um, tweets about children, so we would like you to you know, treat it in a certain kind of way, right? So we could communicate our values through these types of, of um, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, social media data labels, right? And we took this idea, or we got this idea from uh, uh, work that um, Kim Kristen Withy um, at Washington State is doing with the Mukudu um, content management system, right? It's a content management system that uh, deals, that, that was developed to deal with um, um, indigenous collections, right? So indigenous populations have all these protocols about who can access their history, what time of year they can access the history, what history can be shared, can't be shared outside of the community. And one cool thing they came up with is they came up with these um, 
Oh, I can't remember. Traditional knowledge. traditional knowledge labels. Thank you. Right? They call them traditional knowledge labels that they attach that that um, communities building these collections within the Mukuru application uh, can attach these traditional knowledge labels to the collections. So you know the world can 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 still do whatever they want with these collections, but at least the community is, now has a right to to sort of communicate their own values, right? Or the people. Uh, institutions building um, collections using this application can communicate their values. Um, and so I think there are things we can do. There are things we're already doing. But to say that it's too difficult to address uh, um, uh, sort of ethics with this type of, of data and this type of collection, uh, I think is really short-sighted short and, and, and really lazy, actually. Um, but a lot of archivists are doing this and are saying this, right? Um, I could pull up tweets now of archivists saying, well, it's public. Let's, let's take it. Um, and <laughs> I'm not going to, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you know, so I, I think we have to get past that. And, and we could think about taking some of the, 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 the things that we've developed already um, with, with collections we already work with and, and seeing how we can attach them in this space. So with that, you know, let's open it up and take a few more questions. I want to hop on that right quick. Um, in terms of this being a hard problem, that I totally agree. That is intellectually lazy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just speaking in the short time that I've been in journalism, that's, that's a problem that journalism as a field and as a profession has managed to address um, ethics as it pertains to a certain class of people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about white males, you know what I mean, um, straight. The, the, like, we seem to be just fine with that. When it pertains to black people, when it pertains to people of color right. in general, when it tends to pertains to LGBT people, all these sorts of things, suddenly it gets it gets difficult and it gets hard, right? And I'm I'm thinking specifically about um, the constant replays and the constant posting of shootings of black people, black people being killed. You can find these videos anywhere. When you see two white reporters being killed, mm -hmm. suddenly everybody has a really hard time watching right. that video. Right. And, and just full disclosure, I wrote about that, and it was very, very hard to get that article out. Very hard. Um, and every single media outlet was censoring it, wasn't showing the video. They were talking about, we can't show this video because it sickens us. And days before, we had seen the first ever body cam footage of a black man being killed from a first person view. And that was being played, and that was being played uncensored. Mm -hmm. And so to say that this is a hard problem, it's not a hard problem, it's very simple. It's not easy, it's a very simple problem. And so, yeah, I think, you know, to people saying, you know, this is too difficult, this is too difficult, it's not difficult. We, we managed to figure this out. Um, for other people, and so a lot of the stuff we're talking about, we're talking about what people of color are doing, what women are doing, um, you know, what all these um, you know marginalized people are doing online, and we need to treat that with the same kind of rigor that we treat, um, you know, white men with. Let's open it up. Yeah. We have six minutes. <laughs> um. So a lot of the examples that you guys um, gave were really compelling, but they all require this sort of hand verification or case-by-case -case application of ethics. Um, and Dexter gave some particularly poignant examples of how even when someone gives permission, he made some judgment calls that, that they didn't be uh, warned, they, you know, things they should share anyway. Uh, it strikes me that that becomes intractable at any scale, right? So we just don't have the person power to review every tweet. Um, and even if we could review the content of every tweet, we can't generate the networks of embeddedness that then, you know, networks of associations that come with each tweet. Um, we can't, you know, and so on and so on and so on. Um, so uh, where does that leave us? Does that mean that we have to embargo things um, until we get a chance to review them? Does it mean that we apply algorithmic solutions um, as a stopgap and then sort of catch things um, as they come up? Uh, is there something else? I mean, in terms of archives, I'm thinking of a collection that we had at, uh, at the University of Kentucky, the Frontier Nursing Service, which um, 
this was one of the first uh, sort of organizations of midwives, uh, like a massive uh, mid midwifery ne uh, network. Um, however, those files um, they come with a great deal of restrictions because the the nurses generally worked in these areas of eastern Kentucky where the communities were really small, everybody knew everybody, um, and there's information in there that, you know, it talks, it's basically women's reproductive histories and things that they, you know, might have, it, they, they probably would not have wanted out there for women who, you know, were, were using reproductive techniques maybe to not have a child, um, and that would have been a bad thing. And these are still communities that are so small and so tightly knit. I mean, if the university had just jumped up and digitized everything, like, yo, here it is, Frontier Nursing Service, I mean, you could have found out some really, like, damaging information um, about somebody or, or information that could still have repercussions to this day. Uh, and in that case, I think it was just, accepted that, you know, there's a lot of data here. Uh, we don't necessarily have the manpower to comb through all of that. So, um, you know, coming up with the permissions form, number one, was sort of a way of, of holding researchers accountable, too. So it couldn't just be like, oh, well, I got it in the archives, and here it is. But this idea that you as a researcher have to take responsibility, um, some type of ethical responsibility for the things that you're looking up, and that you could also be subject to some sort of legal action if you're using that information improperly um, or not respecting the, the privacy or restriction restrictions that that repository has placed on a thing. Um, but I do think to a certain extent, maybe sometimes it is about recognizing the limitations of our labor. Um, we, if we value the things that we're doing and, and we want them done properly and we want them done in the right way, maybe it means that we can't, you know, we just can't generate all of these tons of, uh, this, uh, tons of information and just throw out there at people. Maybe it is something that takes a lot of time and a lot of thought and a lot of, a lot of asking. Yeah, to follow up on what Stacy said, I guess I would ask, like, whose priority is it that the, the, the cult, like, that it scales? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. do we, yeah. like, who, for whose benefit is the right. collection? And do we need to collect everything in order to tell the story? Yeah, I think that not a lot of institutions that I've seen have um, collection development goals as is related right. to social media data. So everyone's just like, take it all. but. Um, is it actually supporting research done at your institution? Is it actually supporting activism around your institution or anything going on around your institution? And if it is, hopefully you could embed yourself in that community to, again, before you use the tool, have a level of interaction with the people um, so that they're aware of what you're doing. Um, and then, yeah, there are, um, sorry, like there are ways to um, embargo the collection or say you can only use this in aggregate. Like, you can do all of your R analysis that you want to say that in aggregate, this collection holds this kind of stuff, but, you know, we can't allow it to be used on an individual tweet level or something. All right, I think we should end here. Uh, we're cutting into our lunch hour, but thank you uh, so much to all of you.